Rejoice ye. Those are the opening words of our Mass, which we hear in our introit, the Latin being laetare, which means rejoice. And so this is a Sunday of rejoicing. And as we read in Proverbs, a joyful heart is good medicine. And that's what we need at this time. Now, to some people, that's not funny because it hits a little bit too close to home. Truly, these times with the virus about call for gravity. Not fear or despair, but truly gravity. We've all seen people whose mood doesn't match the situation. And so if someone were to be too outwardly happy at this time, they would come across as tone deaf to what most people are feeling right now. Everything is canceled. Our parish was supposed to have had a gala last night for Latari weekend. That was canceled. The economy and our future is uncertain. And so the question is, should Latari Sunday be canceled? I mean, after all, are we tone deaf to be rejoicing today? Well, the answer is a resounding no. And why? Because throughout Scripture, we're told to have joy, especially in hard times. But we need to understand two things. What joy really is, and then how do we have it in hard times? To this end, a scriptural introduction to joy. Now, St. Paul gives us the command to rejoice. Writing in 1 Thessalonians, he says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, Blessed are ye when men persecute you. And in light of this, he says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And so we see from these verses that joy is not about being giddy. It's something much deeper. Writing to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says that joy and sorrow can actually go together. He says, we live as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. If this is true, then the joy he's speaking of is not something that's Pollyanna, and it's not just about outward ebullience. In fact, someone might not even appear happy at all, but have that inward joy. In the same letter, writing to the Second Corinthians in the beginning, he says that he's writing to them with much affliction and anguish of heart and many tears. But yet he says, rejoice always. There's a Catholic psychologist, uh, psychiatrist rather, by the name of Aaron Curiati, who says that he's known many people who have had what St. John of the Cross famously calls the dark night of the soul, but these are people who can still have a ballast that keeps them steady. That's hope that they have deep within. And so even in the darkness of their experience, they can still be inspiring. Now, how do you get like that? How do you get that ballast? In order to help us understand we're going to look at two saints who had joy in prison. Now, someone's ears might perk up because if you're in some kind of a lockdown right now, you might feel like you're in prison in your own home. But these two saints are St. Saint John Chrysostom, writing in the fourth century, and St. Paul, writing to the Philippians when he was in prison and did not expect to get out of that prison alive. But it's in this context that Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always, Again, I say, rejoice. And so what enables this joy in hard times is seeing God clearly, having one's eyes open, so to speak, so we see his qualities, where we see that he is able to give us his strength, we see his sovereignty, and we see his sweetness. Let's consider each of these in turn. So first, God's strength. 
St. John Chrysostom was being led as a prisoner to exile, traveling 200 miles by a mule over difficult country. And during this time, as it turns out, he had a recurring fever. Yet on the way, he wrote this to his friend Olympias. Beware of surrendering yourself to the tyranny of sorrow. Again, beware of surrendering yourself to the tyranny of sorrow. So if you're not going to surrender, then what do you do? You need to be able to stand and to fight. And in order to do that, you need strength, God's strength. St. Paul talks about it this way. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And this gets us closer to the, the kind of joy he's referring to, contentment. I know how to be brought low, he says, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's how he, like St. John Chrysostom, is able to stand and fight against that tyranny of sorrow. But this strength doesn't come out of nowhere. You don't just get God's strength dropping down upon you. It comes from a greater understanding. And that understanding is based on trusting in the sovereignty of God, which means believing that God is in control. Now, this trusting that God is in control doesn't mean that you won't have hard times. No, it means that God is able to bring all circumstances to his glory. And so Chrysostom knew that God would be glorified even if he is deprived. Still, in the same letter to that friend Olympias, he summed up his own spiritual disposition by saying this, Glory be to God for all things, I will never cease saying this, whatever befalls me. And truly, hard times had already fallen upon him. So Chrysostom lived for God's glory, and this is why he could look beyond his own immediate circumstances. So the simple takeaway is that just because you're having hard times does not mean that God is not in control. We're looking for God to be glorified. Paul, likewise, writes of his imprisonment, again, not expecting to get out of this alive. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. The elite Roman guard, some of them had become Christians. Why? Because they saw his joy in the midst of suffering. And this, the fact that the gospel went forward even to his guards, gave him more joy. This would not have been possible if he hadn't had this suffering and had the opportunity to be a witness in the midst of it. And all this points us to sweetness. So we see God's strength, we trust in his sovereignty, and then we're able to truly enjoy him deep down. When you have an intimate relationship with Christ, this fellowship can be sweet no matter the circumstances. Joy, in light of this, is not a grit-your-teeth-and-bear type of Christianity. Chrysostom, in fact, said that his sufferings caused him to be transported with joy. Let's hear those words in context. Who can describe the other troubles which befell me on my journey? The alarms, the risks. I think of them every day and always carry them about with me. I am transported with joy, and my heart leaps to think of the great treasure I have laid up. Do you rejoice over it and give glory to God, who has honored me with these sufferings? These kinds of words we see in all truly holy men and women who aspire to the glory of God. And so Paul likewise says, his the cry of his heart to the Philippians is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings. Of course, we think of fellowship being what we do um, in coffee hour after mass. But notice the hope in the statement. He says that I may know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. 
He takes hold of that resurrection power before the trial is over. And so in light of this, he says that nothing in the world can hold a candle to what he has in Christ. This is where the sweetness comes from. He says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung that I may win Christ. So the question is, how do we become more like St. John Chrysostom, more like Paul and the many saints who have this perspective? Well, let's go back to that first verse that I quoted from 1 Thessalonians. Paul says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. There's two statements that are similar. Rejoice always, always give thanks. In the middle, we have pray without ceasing. If you're not lifting up your heart to God in prayer, then you won't expect his presence to come down to you. But that's the promise when you engage in mental prayer, when you choose to invoke God's presence, call upon the name of Jesus instead of turning to social media or wringing your hands. This is how you cultivate the presence of God. And this becomes the habit of cultivating joy, that deep inward joy. So before we conclude, I just want to share one story to pull together how joy and suffering can go together. It's just a brief example from my life. I won't spare the details, but I'll just say this, that something that I'd worked on for months came crashing down through unexpected circumstances. It felt like the rug was pulled out from under me. And as a result, as I was driving after this happened and that work was all for naught, I had about an hour in the car. And during that time, tears of anguish came. But as I was driving, I began to think, you know, the rug can be pulled out from under me at any time. In fact, I could die tomorrow which made me think about those things that can't be taken away, those eternal joys, realizing that this world is not my home. And then before I even got home, before the tears stopped, those tears of sorrow turned to tears of joy as I began to thank God for these things and say, will you be glorified in whatever time I have on earth, no matter what happens, even in these sufferings? So I may not respond this way every day, but what was I doing right that day? I was looking for God's strength. I was trusting in his sovereignty. And from that came that sweetness, which inspired me to call on him more continually. Jesus says this in the Gospel of John. In the world, you have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's John 16, 33. So, Laetare Sunday is not canceled. And as we go to the altar, we partake of what cannot be taken away. Now, you are not here physically, but by virtue of being part of the body of Christ, this sacrifice at the altar is for you. And so, here in a few moments, you will see the representation of the cross and, and the resurrection. And know this in your crosses, Likewise, you will rise in him. This is the cause for joy. And this, brothers and sisters, is truly good medicine.